Hello, and welcome to today's InfoPeople webinar. InfoPeople is dedicated to bringing you the best in practical library training and improving information access for the public by improving the skills of library workers. InfoPeople is supported in part by the Institute of Museum and Library Services under the provisions of the Library Services and Technology Act administered in California by the State Librarian. Today's webinar is entitled Library Box, Portable Private Digital Distribution, presented by Jason Griffey. Jason is an associate professor and head of library information technology at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. His latest book, Mobile Technology and Libraries, is available as a part of Neil Schumann's Tech Set, the winner of the ALA 2011 award for the best book in library literature. Jason was named a library journal mover and shaker in 2009 and speaks internationally on the future of libraries, mobile technology, ebooks, and other technology related issues. I'm now happy to introduce Jason Griffey. Hi everybody! Thank you uh, so much to Info People for having me uh, having me on, and thanks to what looks like about 54 of you for joining us today. That's a great crowd. Uh, I really do appreciate everybody taking time out of their afternoon um, to to join me to talk about uh, Library Box. And uh, it looks like we've got people from all over the place. I've enjoyed seeing where everybody is from. Uh, Frankfort, Kentucky. The, the, uh, hi, Catherine. That's my, my, my home state, so I'm going to say hi to Kentucky. Um, so today I'm, I'm here to talk to you about uh, the Library Box Project. And uh, the Library Box Project is a project that I started uh, just a little over a year ago um, and has had what I think is a pretty um, uh, pretty interesting uptake among libraries in the U.S. and, uh, as we'll see, in a little bit around the world. Uh, some really interesting, um, some really interesting stuff going on with it. So we're going to talk about the project, about what it is, what it can do. Um, we're going to talk about how it's being used around the uh, around the uh, country and around the world, and then we're going to talk about how you can take advantage and participate. And that'll be our our kind of talk today. But first, I want to kind of set the stage for what Library Box is about and, um, and uh, how I think it can impact libraries. I want to talk a little bit about open source software. Library Box is um, what it is because of open source software. And for those of you who aren't coders or aren't familiar with the phrase, um, open source software is software that is uh, designed so that the code is available. Um, in many cases, software is designed by large companies, and you know you purchase it. And uh, such as you know, Microsoft Office is an example. Well, you don't get to change what Office does. You buy Office, you use Office, uh, but you can't really get in and tinker with it, right? You can't uh, if you want to change the way it looks, or change the way it acts, or change what it does. You can't really do that. Um, open source software is very different. Open source software, it can be produced by companies, it can be produced by uh, individuals, it can be produced in, in, in by consortium, lots of different ways. Um, but the, the underlying ethos is that the, the code that underlies the software is open. Uh, anyone can use it. It's free. The, 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 the catchphrase is uh, free as in speech and free as in beer. Uh, it is free in that it is open and available to everyone, and it is free in that it does not cost you anything. Um, so open source software is really important. It's an important thing for libraries, and it has been for quite a while. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of decades, almost, of uh, libraries taking advantage of open source um open source software. All right. Um, so open source software is something that libraries have been taking advantage of for a long time. And if you did not know what some of the things that libraries are using as uh, that are, that is actually open source, here's, here's just a couple of examples. Um, Apache and Linux are open source softwares that basically run the web. Um, Apache is a web server. Linux is an operating system. Uh, Drupal, WordPress run an enormous number of library websites. Um, Koha, Viewfind, and Evergreen are uh, all systems that were designed by and for libraries, either ILSs or discovery layers that were designed for libraries. And then uh, Chrome 
and Firefox are browsers that most, uh, the, the, the two of those are uh, incredibly popular and most people use, lots of people use those these days. And these are all examples of, if you wanted, you could download and alter, change, manipulate that, that software. So um, LibraryBox is built on open source, um, open source software. Um, so the code for LibraryBox, the stuff that creates it, makes it, is, uh, is open for anyone to change, anyone to manipulate, anyone to make it do what they want in the same kind of way that these things are. So that's, that's important, and um, we'll, we'll talk about why again as we go, as we go through. Uh, the second thing that kind of sets the stage for Library Box and is an interesting kind of the thing that gave rise to to it is um, in addition to open source software, which we've had for a couple of decades now, uh, as a, longer than that actually, but we kind of in libraries it's been up at the forefront of 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 systems development for a couple of decades. Um, we are now entering a period of technology and technology use, technology development where open source um, hardware is something that is being, um, that, that's, that's becoming very, very important. Uh, in a similar way to open source software, where you have the code and you can change it, open source hardware is when someone develops a piece of, of hardware, uh, actual silicon, you know, a chip, um, memory, actual, you know, physical item that you can hold, but publishes all of the specifications of it so that, when you need to change something, you can. Um, this is also important. And it was the combination of having some free software and some open hardware that led uh, to the development of Library Box. And I actually think this is um, maybe the first library specific case of the two of them coming together uh, in, a, in, a, in a really robust way, but I don't think it's the last. I think we're gonna see more and more of this. And uh, the reason is that there are kind of two uh, two laws that I'm going to introduce you to. Um, again, as kind of setting the stage for for why I think Library Box is important. The first of these is Moore's law. And um, if you're not familiar, Moore's law is named after Gordon Moore, uh, who was a co-founder of a company called Intel, which you have probably heard of. Uh, Gordon Moore noted that in the uh, 70s that the development of the microchip was very, very rapid. And he actually did some, some measuring and discovered that every 18 months, the uh, speed of a chip got twice as fast and the cost for manufacturing the chip cut, cut in half. So every 18 months, you got things that did twice as much for half as much money. And that's continued all the way through uh, the modern day. Moore's Law is something that uh, that electronics companies, gadget companies, uh, use as a predictive law in order to um, uh, in order to, to kind of see where hardware is going. So this development uh, has aided in library box. This is something it aids in all hardware production, but um, but it's 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 an important piece of kind of how we got where we are with library box. And the second law is lesser known. Um, it's called Kumi's law. Uh, Jonathan Kumi. Um, came up with, with this particular law, and it's related to Moore's law in that it, it's based on an 18-month cycle. Kumi's law says that every 18 months for a given uh, piece of computation, for a given kind of uh, uh, chip effect, that it will cost half as much energy every 18 months to do it. So um, when you combine Moore's law and Kumi's law, you get things like uh, cell phones that are more powerful than the first computer you ever used, right? Because uh, and the the cell phone does does more than your computer did it it than your first computer did. It um, it has you know more memory, it runs faster, and it does all of that on a battery. All of those things, kind of the combination of smaller, faster, and less energy, um, come from Moore's law and Kumi's law, and this drives the development um, of smaller and smaller, more efficient hardware, which lets you do more interesting things with it. Uh, these, all of these things kind of come together to give us where Library Box came from. All right, and so um, why, did, why was I interested in this? Well, 
what is LibraryVox? What you know? What is it that uh, that it does, and why why are we interested in it? Well, this is a library box. It's a small box about the size of a hockey puck, a little bit a little bit uh, smaller than a hockey puck, and um, it is a portable. Uh, the the co the, the 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 title of the, the presentation: portable private digital distribution. Uh, library box is based on this very small piece of hardware that you then apply some open source software to. You, you, you use some code to alter what it does. And what you end up with is a box that fits in your hand that will run off of a battery that acts as a web server, more specifically as a file server, without any internet access, without, NT, without any access to the larger net at all. It's a private, portable file server. Okay, so... Um, Portable private digital distribution. That's kind of the, the, the tagline for it. Why? Um, so what do you do with this? Well, the idea for Library Box came about um, because I, I, I wanted to be able to, to serve digital files. I wanted to be able to serve uh, ebooks to people. Uh, to their cell phones, to their tablets, to their laptops, whatever, whatever the device they had was. As long as it was Wi-Fi capable, um, and as long as it had a web browser, which is almost everything these days, um, then uh, you could connect to Library Box even without a larger internet. So you could, you could carry this little tiny thing that fits in your pocket, and you could serve files to it. You could serve files from it, sorry. So I could go to uh, just as some examples, right? So I could take this to a uh, an art festival that was happening in my town, and I could provide uh, a digital library for people to download uh, books, music, movies, images, pretty much anything that I could think of, anything that that I could that I could, that I could put on the box, uh, and they could download it directly from me. Um, now. You can do that with a lot of pieces of equipment. You could do that with a laptop, for example. Most laptops have the ability to, to become their own web server and share Wi-Fi and do that. So what's the big deal with LibraryBox? Well, we'll, uh, we'll see. So LibraryBox is open source. Um, the code is all available um, on GitHub. GitHub is a social coding site where people share code. So there's nothing secret or proprietary or anything like that. It's, it's totally free, free as in beer, free as in speech. You can go to that website that's on the screen now. You can download everything there is to use to build a library box. And the real secret is that the hardware is incredibly cheap. And when I say incredibly cheap, I mean very, very cheap. Um, it's based on the, in the upper uh, left-hand corner, you see a little, a little box called TP-Link. That's the company that makes it. It's based on a piece of hardware called the TP-Link MR3020. It's just a code for, uh, for this little, little router that uh, TP-Link makes. This costs about um, $30, $35. Uh, on Amazon right now. Okay, so it costs about thirty-five bucks on Amazon, and uh, so for thirty-five dollars, thirty thirty-five dollars, you can have a box that you then put some code on, make it a library box, and you can serve files. You can serve your patrons stuff anywhere you happen to be. Uh, there's lots of use cases for this, and there's a lot of different ways that libraries are using it, and we're going to talk about a few, but um, if, if you are at a public library and your library has a, uh, a bookmobile for $35 and about 25 to 30 minutes of time to build one, uh, you could have the ability to share ebooks uh, or, again, music or any digital file that you'd like to share from your, um, from your bookmobile. Um, a question from uh, Thomas, is Wi-Fi built in or do you need to connect to a Wi-Fi router? It is a Wi-Fi router. It provides its own both Wi-Fi and, uh, uh, it provides its own Wi-Fi. You use a thumb drive as your storage mechanism for it. You have to have a, have to have a USB stick. So the actual files are saved on a thumb drive and the box is a Wi-Fi signal. 
It, it, it is its own web server and it provides its own Wi-Fi. So uh, you literally need um, the box, a USB key, and some manner of powering it. Um, it is actually powered by USB power. So it will run off of a battery. It will run off of a, off of a uh, car charger. It will run off of a solar panel. It will run off of a plug in the wall. It will run basically anything. It's a, it's, it's, it runs off of USB power, and it is incredibly efficient. Um, very, very, very low power usage. The little battery that um, uh, the little battery that you see in this particular picture is a tiny little thing. It's you can see it's about the size. It's about the same size as the as the router itself. It's very thin, um, smaller again, smaller than a hockey puck. Uh, that battery will run the uh, the wireless router. It will run the library box for uh, a day. It'll run it hours and hours and hours and hours. Um, five, six, seven hours, giving depending exactly on usage. And a slightly larger battery will run it for 14 to 15 hours. I have uh, I've literally put my a library box in my bag with a battery and ran it for an entire convention on a single battery. It is um, uh, very, very, very power efficient. So that's the that's the overall idea is um, to to have this incredibly cheap way of delivering digital files to people in areas that do not have any other signal. Um, the, the point of it is to be able to take it with you where there is no Wi-Fi or, or even cellular signal, frankly. Um, you can take it anywhere and power it off almost anything and still be able to deliver files to patrons. So to use it, the actual in use, you know, use case, and I'll, I'll Sue, I'll answer that question in just one second. Um, the actual use case is it provides a Wi-Fi signal. The Wi-Fi signal is called library box. So when you look at your list of Wi-Fi on your device, uh, you know, you know, say you have a, an iPhone, you go to your Wi-Fi setup. Um, the 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 SSID, the Wi-Fi signal, is just called library box. And if you connect to it and launch a web browser. The web browser will, you know, you reload a web page or go to any web page. It acts as what's called a captive portal, and it gives you this page. This is what the library box interface looks like. And you can see at the top it says, learn more about the project, and there's information about the project, and then browse and download files. And if you click that, it will give you a list of files that are available. You literally touch a file, and it will download to your device. It's, it, it's exactly that easy. The chat box in the middle, the little the little chat that you can see there in the middle, it says library box, free speech and free content, is a uh, option. You can either turn that on or turn that off when you set the box up. And if it's on, it allows people to talk to them to talk to each other while they're using the box. So if you're in a community situation, uh, if you're in a in a in a in a uh, farmers market or in you know some some situation where you're out in the community, people could actually talk to each other. Uh, using this little chat box. Um, it's totally anonymous. There's no logs kept. Uh, there's no login necessary. The box itself doesn't keep track of who is downloading anything. Um, so there are no kind of patron privacy issues or questions about uh, questions about uh, anonymity. There's just it is designed in order to uh, it is designed in order to to give kind of the uh, you know, anonymity to the, the availability of downloading. There is a reason for the skull and crossbones, and uh, you'll see why in just a second. Uh, although that is changing, and I'll I'll we'll talk about that too. Um, I did want to get back to Sue's question very quickly um, regarding eBooks. Is this legal? Is this piracy? Is this copyright infringement? The box itself is a a file server. What you put on it will determine whether or not it is legal or piracy or a copyright infringement. Um, what you share, you have to have the legal right to share. And um, in many cases, that may mean that you, uh, that you share public domain works. Um, my, the library box that I carry around and that I use at um, conferences and things like that will either have public domain books, public domain music, 
or freely licensed in some way, Creative Commons licensed uh, works, Creative Commons licensed music, um, public domain movies, or things that I have a right, obviously, the things I create, right? I can share the things I create. I'm the copyright holder. So um, so I have my own books on there. I have, um, I have my, own, uh, my own presentations, my own, that sort of thing. So I can share the things I create. Um, this is not, to be clear, this is not an overdrive server. This is not a uh, share anything you want to share server. This is a, a file server like any other file server. And the legality of it is entirely up to you, depending on uh, what you share. Uh, but what this does is allow you to have, again, a file server anywhere, even off the internet, even outside the range of a cell signal, for $35. It's the combination of what it can do and how inexpensive it is that um, I think leads it to be a, an interesting opportunity for libraries. So the history of LibraryBox. Uh, really quickly, let's, I, I just want to kind of give you a background as to where LibraryBox came from and the reason <coughs> for the skull and crossbones. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I became aware of a, a, a project called PirateBox. Pirate Box is a uh, project that was developed as an art project by an NYU art professor named David Darts. And Pirate Box was originally allowed, was originally designed literally as an art project. It was a statement about um, file sharing and the legality of, of of such. So it was designed. Pirate Box was designed to be a an anonymous file sharing uh, vector. It allowed people to um, connect and then upload and download files as they wished. So if you had a pirate box, and there on the left in the, um, in the Skull and Crossbones um, lunchbox is, uh, is the first, one of the first pir uh, pirate boxes. Uh, pirate box, you, you'll notice, is in a huge lunchbox and has an antenna sticking out the side. It was originally designed um, with very large uh, hardware, and it needed big batteries to run. It was um, something that required kind of a hefty, you know, big big box to carry around, and it needed to be plugged in. The um, uh, the pirate box concept was an art project, and it was it was great. It was very cool, but completely unsuitable for use uh, in a library or an educational setting. And uh, I think for probably pretty obvious reasons, if you have an anonymous box in a public place that anyone can upload anything to, pretty quickly there's likely to be things on that box that you may not want on that box. Um, let's, you know, and, and let's, say, let's say that and leave it at that. Um, there's there's likely to be problems. So um, as I kind of watched the development of Pirate Box, um, I thought it was interesting. It was an interesting project. It was an interesting um, idea, and I, I kept thinking, ah, if, if you know, if there was only some kind of way to alter it, if I could if I could get in and play around with it, maybe I could make it useful for for libraries. Uh, because the concept of a really inexpensive file server was interesting. Well, it wasn't until um, about January, I think, of 2012, that a uh, couple of coders took the Pirate Box project and made it run on this little box, the, the TP-Link uh, MR3020, which uh, I mentioned Library Box is based on. And once it was on this really small, really inexpensive hardware, again, this open hardware that I, you could get in and hack, um, once it was on this, um, it became very inexpensive for, for me to to buy one and say, okay, well, I'm going to play with it now. Now I can buy one of these things. It's, it's very inexpensive. If, if I can't get it to work, you know, okay, it's $35 that I wasted. But if I can get it to work, maybe it'll be cool. Um, okay, so uh, Sue had another question. Sorry, I didn't, didn't see it until just now. Does this allow cell phone usage? Sue, maybe you can clarify. I'm not exactly what you mean by that. Um, it, uh, yeah, maybe clarify exactly what the question is. You can use a cell phone to interact with it, yes, but it works over Wi-Fi, so it doesn't. Um, 
Uh, yes, if you you can, it, it's uh, it provides its own Wi-Fi signal. You don't have to have anything other than a device to interact with it. Um, even if you're out of range of cell phone, even if you turn the cell phone radio in your phone off, um, it will it the Wi-Fi will still connect and still work. Yeah, totally totally independent of of, of cell. So that's yeah, one of the benefits. So, um, so back to the history very quickly. Once the once once it became very inexpensive to play with this, I uh, started hacking around at it. And after um, a few weeks of, of kind of getting my head around it, um, I had something that I that I decided to call, for pretty obvious reasons, a library box. Um, the version one of library box I. Uh, kind of unveiled, if, if you want to put it that way, at Computers and Libraries uh, 2012, the Computers and Libraries Conference. So um, it looked like this, and uh, for uh, giggles, I hollowed out a book and used a book to hold it uh, as a box, which I thought was, you know, kind of funny. Um, so let's see. Like an external hard drive for my laptop that connects to the Internet. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to clarify very quickly because I've got multiple people asking. This does not connect to the internet. That's actually the point of it. It does not connect to anything. You use a device to connect to it and download things that are on it. So the, it's a, it's a file server that will serve files to devices regardless of anything else. There doesn't have to be internet access outside of it. There doesn't have to be cell phone access outside of it. I could take this box to the middle of North Africa where there is no cell phone and no internet access of any sort. I could keep this, take this box with me to the middle of a village, and villagers who had cell phones could download books from it. That's the use case, and that's what it does. I hope that helps. It broadcasts its own signal. That's the that's that's what it does. So anyway, sorry, a couple of people still figuring it out, and I know it's kind of an odd concept. So um, I, I hope that helps. And if it doesn't, let me know, and we'll talk about it some more. Um, so this was version one. Uh, version one was really rough. It was um, very hard to replicate. It wasn't. I published all the code, but it was uh, it wasn't something that others could really pick up and use. Um, and then you know continued working, and uh, in October or November of last October of last year, um, version 1.5 came out, and 1.5 um, was uh, cleaner, faster, easier to replicate. It, uh, it did uh, a, a lot of kind of cleaning of the code. It, uh, most importantly, provided very, very easy to follow instructions. I was able to clarify the uh, instructions so that anyone, even a non-technical user, if they simply follow the instructions, much like baking a cake, even if you have no idea what a cake is, if you, re if you religiously follow the instructions, you can build a library box. Um, requires a very basic understanding of um, kind of what you're doing helps, but uh, if you simply follow the instructions, you can do it. And that was the that was kind of uh, 1.5, and that's where we are right now. Um, so again, the benefits of library box is that it's off the grid. It doesn't require anything except itself to provide people with files. And that, I think, is, again, the real, the real benefit of it. Taking it off the grid with no, you know, in the middle of nowhere where there's no internet, running it off of uh, solar power or running it off of a battery, um, you can take it places in the world where, you, where there is no other internet. There is no internet. And you can still use it to provide people with digital files. And this actually turns out to be, I think, um, one of the reasons it's become popular. Because even in places where there is not reliable internet, right, uh, people still have cell phones. The primary way people interact with the world is cell phones, even if they live somewhere where the signal is, uh, is troublesome. 
There's also a few other interesting uses, uh, as it turns out, that uh, that became kind of uh, you know, came to my, came to uh, uh, people's minds when I released you know, released the code. So it, again, it's thirty five dollars. It's very very inexpensive. So the the risk of failure is pretty low. Um, and the use cases that started to emerge as people um, as people uh, started picking it up and building their own and seeing what they could do with it is um, is pretty cool. Um, in uh, in in a situation where you have again kind of questionable internet access, um, Library Box can help deliver files that you want to. Um, to your patrons. So let's see, Michelle. Any limit on file type? Uh, I have not found a limit on file type. It is just a it is just a delivery mechanism. The uh, it will deliver. We've delivered everything from eBooks, again, music, movies, media files. We've delivered. We've used them to deliver data sets, big data sets. The only real limit is. Uh, the only limit is the size of the USB key. The USB key is the storage for it. So the little USB key that plugs into the side. So if you have a, a two gigabyte USB, obviously you're limited to two gigabytes for the files that are on there. But you can buy, you know, eight, 16, 32 gigabyte USB files, uh, USB keys, sorry, and provide, you know, larger and larger and larger files. So. So if you're a library and you're doing outreach to your community, so, uh, you can build a library box and, and take it with you. And then um, people can connect and download files as they, as they wander through. Farmers markets, art exhibits. Um, uh, we'll talk about what one of the, one of the librarians um, is doing in his community with it um, in just a minute. A lot of people have have uh, explored the idea of using them as part of a larger gaming outreach sort of thing. So they've set up library boxes kind of in their city, running in different places throughout the city, and then have run sort of a a um, uh, I don't want to say hide and seek, but a a game where you visit each library box to get different pieces of a puzzle digitally from them, or uh, a, a kind of digital scavenger hunt that is powered by library boxes that are spread across the uh, that are spread across the uh, across the city. One librarian was using it as a virtual graffiti installation and uh, taking pictures of graffiti around the city and then uploading those to the library box and letting people then download the the images of the graffiti around the city. So this kind of interesting, this interesting digital art sort of project. Uh, if you are familiar with the phrase geocaching, geocaching is a sport where people use GPS devices to locate to locate uh, objects in the world, uh, a, a cache, a sort of little digital, a little lockbox that has things in it. If you're not familiar, Google geocaching. But people are using library boxes as sort of a digital geocache. They're, you know, you, you set out a library box and then people find it and download things from it as a, as a, uh, as a, as a geocaching exercise. Okay, so a couple other questions. Let's see. Uh, how easy is it to download files to a device? The, uh, it, it's literally a web browser. So it, it, from the time you connect until the time you're downloading files is like three clicks, I think. Uh, you refresh files and then the file you want. The, uh, how long does it take? Uh, it's very, very fast. Um, it actually is, it's 802.11g, if that speaks to you. Um, so it, it, will, uh, it will provide, it provides very fast access to files. And does it allow users to navigate through the files and be selective in which files to download? Yes, it actually just provides a, currently the current installation, the current instantiation of Library Box, just provides a list, a straight alphabetical list of files that you can scroll through and um, and you know click to download the one you want. One more question: security risks. Uh, I'm not sure kind of what you have in mind. Maybe you're t if you're talking about uh, computer security, like viruses and that sort of thing, the 
box only serves what you put on it. If you put a file on it, then if you put a file on it that has a virus on it, then it's the file has a virus. So what gets downloaded will have a virus. But so the the security is totally dependent upon the user, on the person who's actually putting the files on there. Okay. Multilingual access, uh, one box for each language or use separate URLs. You could actually use separate folders to provide um, to provide uh, different uh, different language types. So you could have a, a folder that said, you know, Espanol or English, you know, any any other language. Um, currently coded to support multiple character sets. It does. It's a we can we'll look at the underlying. We'll talk just a tiny bit about the underlying, but it's underneath. It's Linux, so it does support uh, basic character sets. There are people that are working on actual language. One of the things that we're working on is actual language uh, packs, so it can be changed. The advantage of this over a thumb drive is that it can interact with devices that can't accept a thumb drive. Uh, well, that certainly is one advantage. Yes. Um, if you um, if you're sharing with cell phones, obviously most cell phones don't have USB ports. Um, it also is is available for multiple people simultaneously, so you can serve a large crowd all at the same time. Um, and then uh, lastly, before I move on to other use cases, anyone can put files on, or is there a control point? Uh, anyone can access the files if they have access to the Wi-Fi signal. Uh, putting files on there is is uh, the USB key. So whoever controls physically controls the box controls the files that are on there. So if you plug in, you know, if you, you plug in the USB key, that's the stuff it's serving. So, all right. So I'll get back to more questions in a second. So uh, fun. So there's, there's there's some fun aspects, but then there are some more kind of substantive aspects of it. Um, Library Box can be used in educational. Uh, situations to serve files that are needed for educational use, right? So you could preload a library box with a set of uh, of, of educational files, uh, ebooks about you know li early literacy ebooks. Um, you could uh, put uh, textbooks, whatever, right? And then you could literally drop it <laughs> somewhere in the middle of a village. You could take it with you to areas without connectivity and people could download that material from it. Um, one really interesting educational use is that I, I've actually had a, a few people build them specifically because they couldn't provide access to their students to materials that they wanted because of filtering on the school's network. So I've got a couple of people in middle school who are middle school or high school teachers who have built library boxes specifically because they wanted to provide access to an ebook or a PDF or something to their students who you know have a uh, who have a, a, a wireless device and the schools internet filter prevents them from getting it off of the internet. So you can use it as a local file server not connected to the internet that bypasses all of the kind of censorship or control issues that are uh, that may be built in. That's kind of interesting. Um, healthcare, again, um, I've been contacted by a couple of librarians at the uh, UN and a couple of librarians who work with um, with uh, non first world countries who wanted to experiment with it as a method for distribution of first aid information um, in areas without reliable electrical grid or internet access. So because it can be powered from solar, uh, it could be a portable medical library for a community who may not have direct access to the internet to get that sort of um, to get that sort of information. And in, in a similar kind of way, right, in an emergency situation where normal um, internet or electrical um, signals are disrupted, you could still have the ability to distribute emergency response information locally um, uh, to, to emergency responders or, or you know, at just uh, community users. Um, who who may you know want to to interact with the information digitally? You could, it could be a hyper local digital file sharing device for <clears throat> areas that may not have 
well, may not have electricity at all, frankly. And then I, I already mentioned this sort of, but um, it, because it's off the grid and it is um, not connected to anything else, the uh, it bypasses traditional controlled or restricted internet usage. So firewalls or other access controls that um, keep people from getting information on the net um, are, are, are bypassed by Library Box. So educational information, I gave you the example of the middle school or the high school where the control, um, where the, um, the, uh, the internet uh, signal is limited or controlled, filtered, etc. Um, and I've got a story in a little bit about um, my favorite library box story about how that is um, how it's being used to do that. Um, so uh, let's see a couple more questions before I talk techie bits. Does it keep any kind of statistics? Not currently, but that is in the works for version two. Uh, do I have a list of libraries with library box? Um, I think somebody posted the map. I'll show you the map here in just a second on one of the slides if you don't want to jump out into another uh, browser. And then finally, Michael asks, how far does the signal reach? It's an 802.11bg signal. And um, on a perfectly flat uh, piece of ground with no interference at all, it will probably go um, many, 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 many football fields. But in a normal building <laughs> with, uh, you know, walls that are made of concrete and things, um, it, will, it will easily cover a... Um, easily cover a conference hall. Um, I've tested it in a variety of, of kind of conference venues and a variety of libraries, that sort of thing. Um, it normally goes 100, 150 feet, maybe 200 feet inside a building. Um, but that, again, depends on kind of how the building's built. So, so the techie bits. Uh, underneath... Um, this is running, for those of you who care about the techie bits, uh, we won't linger on this, but um, underneath it's running OpenWRT. OpenWRT is a Linux-based is Linux based firmware that runs on a, a huge variety of uh, Wi-Fi routers. Uh, it's used in this particular instance on the, the uh, TP-Link MR3020 to convert it into something that is hackable. Basically, that you can get in and then um, and then mess with the um, mess with the, the innards of um, building a library box is um, again pretty straightforward. It's very recipe driven, and if you go to the library box website, which is just librarybox.us, um, then uh, you flash the MR3020 with OpenWRT. You install Pirate Box, which is still the base. It's still the thing that Library Box is built on top of. But then you run Library Box, uh, the install from the USB drive, and it um, and it converts it into a Library Box. So it's a three-step process with some steps in the middle. Uh, if you go to the website, you will uh, you will see a very 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 detailed build log how that uh, how how to build one yourself. So. Um, what do you need to be able to build one? Uh, it helps to have the ability to navigate the command line. That is, to have some basic knowledge of what a command line is and how to get around in it. Ability to use Google for VI commands that you don't understand. Um, VI is an editor, a text editor. And um, you, you may not know what that is or even how to use it, but if you can use Google, you can find out how to use it. Cause it's pretty straightforward. You only need to know about three things. Uh, a little bravery and some cunning, just in case something goes wrong. There are um, there are instructions on how to recover from a bad uh, from a mistake or something. There's a lot of instructions again on the website that that covers that. But bravery and cunning never hurts. So, are people using Library Box? Yes, they are. Uh, when I launched Library Box originally in um, in uh, early 2012, we kind of had this kind of distribution, a couple of people playing with it. But over time, it's actually grown quite a bit. And this is the latest map of uh, library boxes that have been added to the map. I, I ask anybody that builds one to add it to this public map. Um, it doesn't, you know, people don't always do that. So there are more being used than are on the map. But uh, this gives you a good idea of the geographical distribution and kind of where um, you know where these are are these days. Um, we have library. 
boxen. Yeah, the, the appropriate plural is library boxen uh, instead of boxes. Boxen is a, a callback to old school uh, computing. Um, we have uh, library boxes currently in 14 U.S. states that I know of. Again, it may be more, almost certainly is, but I know that we're in 14 different states, seven different countries, five different continents. I have no idea what's wrong with South America. Antarctica I can live without, but South America, there needs to be one there. I don't know. I don't know why there's not. Um, there are hundreds of these that have been built, and I know that there are thousands and thousands of files that have been shared. Um, over the course of the last year. Um, some of the examples of how people are using this is um, this is the website of the uh, Lake Forest Library, and a librarian there named Matt Neer was probably the very first librarian to build his own and pick up on it, and he's using it all over the place. He's using it um, to travel to art festivals. He's visiting local artists and getting them to agree to give him some digital art so he can use it on the box to share with the rest of the community. He's gathering uh, the, his community's own works and then sharing it with, with it. Um, really, really neat, interesting use of the, of the box as a, a kind of a part of a building community. Um, this is a uh, map of a very small town outside of Lyon, France, uh, where a group of librarians built a series of library boxes and put them in little stand-up kiosks all throughout the city. They have um, a series of these where they installed um, where they installed library boxes along with some instructions on how to download things from them, and uh, they they kind of spread them around the city to increase the usage of the library and to increase the ability of people to get stuff. Right, so you can see this is their setup, and in the back left there, or in the back top right, you can see the little library box uh, setting there, serving files. Um, library box was used at this year's South by Southwest. A group of librarians, uh, archivists, and museum people called South by Southwest LAM Libraries, Archives, and Museums contacted me because they had an idea of how to uh, how to kind of increase the um, perception of libraries could get more people talking about them at South by Southwest, which is an enormous technology festival, South by Southwest Interactive. So they, um, they had 10 of them. Uh, I helped them build 10 um, uh, library boxes. They took them with them to Austin, Texas, powered by little batteries. They put a bunch of really interesting um, content on there, including some books from MIT Press, some um, data sets from the Digital Public Library of America, lots and lots of really interesting stuff. And then they attached them to pedal cabs so that the city of Austin, Texas, during South by Southwest, had a series of movable libraries wandering around their city that people could connect to. And and download things from, uh, which was just really awesome. Uh, and yeah, the other, there was a, I see somebody, there's a couple of uh, articles that were written about this. This is a blog post from the Digital Public Library of America that talks about um, how they were using it. Really fascinating, really great. And then my very favorite library box story, which I'll tell very quickly, um, so that we don't run out of time and not get to more questions, is that um, I was contacted by a librarian, or sorry, not a librarian, a uh, teacher um, of English, uh, English as a foreign language teacher in um, Shenzhen, China. And he contacted me to tell me that he was very, very interested in Library Box, but he couldn't he couldn't get it to work on the local hardware. The hardware that he bought in China was a little different than the hardware that we have here in the U.S. And... Um, so I asked, well, why, what are you doing? Like, why, why, are you, why are you interested in building a library box? And his answer was that because uh, of the, um, the Great Firewall of China, that the students that he was teaching couldn't get the educational materials that he needed. So he had um, a series of students, lower income, they couldn't afford a VPN or some other way to get out of the Great Firewall and get the, uh, the information that they needed. But um, he still needed to teach them, right? He needed to get them the information. So uh, he contacted me, sent me uh, the, the Chinese version of the hardware um, 
that I could use to tweak the code to make sure that it worked. And so we worked together. We got it working. And he uh, now is using this to share English language materials in his classrooms and also building additional library boxes for other English teachers in Shenzhen to try and provide English language materials um, in areas that most need it. Speaking English is a huge advantage in um, Shenzhen in China and in China in general, but in Shenzhen specifically because of the interactions with um, the foreigners who are interested in making um, electronics in Shenzhen. So uh, this was my favorite story because it enables the learning and the sharing of information in a way that I think is very, very core to the mission of the library. Um, in an area where freedom of information is most at risk. And I think that that, is, that that really, really excited me. And that was one of the things that made me kind of push forward. So what, what's next? Um, what's next? Well, um, I'm hoping to continue to make it more functional uh, and to change kind of some of the things that it does. I'm hoping to provide, to keep it being more and more functional in libraries uh, and educational. I want to make the installation even easier. Uh, I need to work to make it as kind of push button as possible. Right now, you still need to futz around on a command line, and hopefully that will that will stop in the next version. Um, I'm, I'm trying to find some funding to boost development. There's a, a limit to what I can do by myself, and while I've had a couple of people help me here and there, uh, it is a project that is has a great community and a really robust uh, number of people talking about it, and not um, you know not not as many people as I'd like working on it. So Library Box 2.0, Library Box 2.0, the next the next stage is coming, and some of the things that will uh, be in the 2.0, um, hopefully, given that I can get it all done, is um, statistics, because that really is important for us to know that people are using it. Um, it needs to be easier to install. That needs that, that is definitely something that we want to happen. Um, it needs to be even more friendly. It works on pretty much every mobile device that I've ever tested, but um, it, it would be better if, it was a, if the, the interface was a little cleaner. It needs to be a little prettier, frankly. Um, Libraries have contacted me and wanted to be able to change what the page looks like, right? To put their own logo on it, to um, to uh, alter the language, that sort of thing. So I'd I'd like to make it easier for libraries to do that. I got to figure out how to make that happen. And then um, because it only runs on this one piece of hardware, and if TP-Link decides to discontinue that piece of hardware, I might be in trouble. I'm hoping that I can um, test more and more hardware um, so I can. You know, if, if a cheaper piece of hardware will run the software, then we should use that instead, because cheaper is better. Um, it's easy to get involved. If you're interested in Library Box, if you want to learn more, uh, the, the web page, uh, librarybox.us, it is um, there. There's a Google group community of people talking and, and figuring out how to use this device. Um, lots of librarians, lots of educators, lots of techies all kind of coming together to figure out what they want to do with it. Um, and then in um, because I am trying to find some cash to help fund um, getting people to help me, I'd like to be able to pay people uh, to actually do some of the things that need to be done. Um, in late June, uh, hopefully around the time of ALA Annual, I'm hoping to launch a Kickstarter to, um, for Library Box 2.0. So hopefully um, I'll be able to raise um, not a lot of money, but a little bit of money um, to, uh, to move forward with this project. Because I think it has some promise, and I think there's a lot of interesting things that you can do. And um, thank you. That's, uh, that's that. I'll get to a couple of these questions now. Sorry about that. While, while I'm getting to the questions, I'll leave this slide up for just a second. This is me. Um, this is my email, website, uh, my cell phone number, <laughs> uh, my Twitter address, and uh, Pinboard is where I put a lot of kind of my research links. There's a lot of stuff there uh, that you can uh, follow up on if you want to dig into uh, dig into Library Box. So, um, <clears throat> sorry. Okay. So questions. Um, let's see. What kind of geeks do you need, uh, Michelle? Uh, yeah, mostly programmers. I've got a few people that um, have already offered to help with documentation. Documentation is hard. I don't know if you've uh, I don't know if you've uh, if you've ever tried to do tech tech documentation, but it's uh, it is a very difficult thing to get right and um, 
so that's uh, that. I think I've got some people that are willing to help me with, but programmers are always hard to uh, to find, especially good ones that kind of get the project. Um, so I'm always looking for people that are willing to help. Yeah, with the uh, with the programming. Um, Nathan, preloaded library boxes to earn money. That's kind of what Kickstarter is going to be. Um, the Kickstarter is going to have a, a, a pre-built library box as a reward, you know, um, tier. But again, it, right now it's j just me, and uh, library box is my part is like my my secondary uh, <laughs> my my secondary uh, project uh, I my job is my primary project so uh, trying to to sell them outright just feels a little weird so hopefully the Kickstarter will get me enough that I can make the 2.0 happen and then um, we can move forward from there the 1.5 don't get me wrong 1.5 is totally usable you can build one right now for $35 that will that will absolutely work for your library um, it will absolutely let you share files out in your community, uh, or if you serve areas that are, you know, if you serve Native American reservations, if you serve, if you serve places without reliable internet access, um, then taking, you know, the 1.5 totally usable, but um, it needs to be better. Uh, everything needs to be better, right? Um, so let's see, Scott, I created two boxes late last fall, but found them really slow. Uh, yes, the yes. Um, so the script did improve. Um, the uh, there were some optimizations made. If you are on the Google group, if you search uh, on the Google group for for s slow, I think we'll probably get you there. Um, you'll find um, a uh, instructions on how to fix that. Uh, if not, if you don't see it, just email me. Um, because it is it is it, there's an easy fix. Uh, we 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 tracked that bug down and fixed it. So. Um, it's much, much, much faster now. So yeah, we can we can definitely fix that, Scott. Um, I will uh, announce the Kickstarter campaign everywhere I possibly can. Uh, <laughs> trust me, um, it will be on my website. It'll be on uh, Twitter. It will be on the Library Box site. Um, and I'm going to try to get you know as much media coverage as I can. So I'm going to try to get um, you know. Try to try to get it everywhere I can. My goal is to have it live by ALA annual. So, uh, fax or stuff on the chat feature. Um, there's no there's no frequently asked question specifically on the chat feature. Um, if you um, not sure what the question would be, but if you have one, I'm happy to answer it. But um, uh, it, the chat feature is incredibly basic. It's it's literally like type in the box and hit enter, and it gets posted. There's no kind of complexity there. Uh, can you have multiple landing pages? Yes. Uh, languages. Right now, I've got uh, people that are interested in um, French because it was a the uptake in France was very large. I had one person volunteer for Spanish. Those are the only two so far, and it needs to as part of the 2.0, we need to rearchitect it a little bit to make that easy. Um, the, so I'm hoping that the 2.0 will include languages, or very shortly after that. Uh, right now, there is no way to have multiple landing pages, but again, with the 2.0, um, hopefully that would be that'll that not hopefully that should be trivial with the 2.0. So um, should not be a big deal. And I I, th I think unfortunately I'm out of time. Um, uh, Eileen, did you have some information you need to share? I do. I'm plugging share, the survey or, uh, link into Stanley? text chat, and I'm going to pull up a slide that has a link to it as well. Um, I wanted to thank Jason for another really, I heard about Library Box a while ago and was just really fascinated. And um, thank you so much for presenting it to our audience as well. And we're looking forward to a Library Box 2.0 and the Kickstarter campaign.